Good morning. We want to welcome everyone here to First Baptist Church of Lloyd. Uh, great to see everybody lined up nice and in a row here and few people in their uh, chairs out front. We appreciate that. Appreciate people joining us online, whether it be Facebook or YouTube. Uh, volume up. I don't have control of the volume from here, so is it better now? Yeah. Okay. All right. So again, we welcome everyone here, and then uh, we want to... Uh, have you guys join us again next Sunday. We are going to be back inside uh, for next Sunday, so we'll, we'll be glad to be gather again for that. We are going to hold off on the Wednesday night services uh, for the next couple of weeks, and then men's Bible study, uh, a, a date will be coming for that as well. So let's pray, and we'll get started this morning. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for this uh, uh, cloud overcast so we don't have to fight with the sun father we thank you for the weather every day that you bring us uh, some days rain some days the hot some days the uh, uh, exactly what we need father and we thank you for that we thank you for the change in seasons as we we can look forward to coming up to cooler weather in the future at some point uh, father god we thank you that you're in control and, and lord again as people are uh, healing up and getting back to it and we thank you that we can come together as your church to, to lift up your name and praise your name as we're gonna, going to do right now in jesus name amen all right good morning, good morning. can y'all hear me Okay, they can hear me, good. First song this morning is Majesty. grace that one's coming later you'll get to do that one later <laughs> we will see jesus paint it all eventually What? 
good morning, everybody. It's not quite as, as pretty as it was last week, but the weather is nice. It's calm. And if I speak in a calm like manner, you will all be relaxed enough to hear. Jesus loves you. Amen? Amen. So let's start there. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we can't help but thank you enough for, for healing our folks and uh, providing several different options in which we were able to be healed by you. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. God, for the trials that we go through, we know that it builds our faith. But for the temptations that are before us, we need you to run from them, to help us, provide a way of escape. God, there are many that are still asking for healing. They're asking for wisdom and for care. And so, God, we dedicate this time to you in a special way. We pray that prayer, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming and joining us live. We last left off with the trials that we're facing, that James said to count it all as joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Patience is not something that comes by naturally, except it is a gift of the Spirit, but it's like a muscle. It needs to be worked out. It needs to be improved through. And so God will put you in trials because he wants you complete and lacking nothing. Now, if you need wisdom, you're supposed to ask. Don't doubt, but ask in faith. Oswald Chambers said that faith for my deliverance, that's not faith in God. That's trying to get deliverance from circumstances. Faith means whether I'm visibly delivered or not. I'll stick to my belief that God is love and that there are some things that are only learned in a fiery furnace. How I wish that was not always the case. I know that there's a lot of lessons out there today that you wish you could have learned in a different way. But unfortunately, it does seem like we have learned more from our failures than we ever have our successes. Listen, this morning, God wants you to know that he loves you, that he hasn't left you. He wants you to know that he wants your relationship with him to be fully complete, lacking nothing. So James gives us more instruction, chapter 1, verse 9 and on. Here's what he says in order to describe how to get more joy and more comfort from him. In verse 9, he says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he'll pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat that it withers on the grass. Its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Getting started this morning... The first point you really need to understand is to remember how temporary everything is. Just simply remember how temporary everything is. We are supposed to find joy in the Lord and rejoice. So let's make it real clever. You ready? It's a choice to rejoice. I thought about that all by myself. So aren't you proud? That was pretty good, wasn't it? But you need to say it next week. It's a choice to rejoice. Nobody's making you. You can be grumpy. You can be sour. You can complain at length about the circumstances of life. But see, God's testings have a way of leveling us. When testing comes to the poor man, he's supposed to let God have his way and then rejoice that he has all kinds of spiritual riches that can't be taken from him. Likewise, the rich man, when testing comes his way, He's supposed to let God have his way and rejoice that the riches in Christ cannot pass away and cannot fade away. In other words, it's not your material resources that take you through the testings of life. It's the spiritual resources that God gave you. And in our lives, material possessions can be a temptation. That's why there's all kinds of shows that feature hoarders. People like to gather. They like to accumulate. They like to have multiple storage units. Right, folks? This is what people do. But unfortunately, there's not too many shows that feature families or groups of people that tend to give everything away. Somehow having more, buying more, gathering. 
It's more appealing to TV audiences than being generous. Apparently money and social status has been a problem all throughout the life of the Bible, but especially among those in the early church. You see, both rich and poor will be in the kingdom of heaven, James says. So allow me to put it in perspective this morning. That's the title of the message, Perspective. See, being poor doesn't mean that you're more humble because of your lowly state in life. And being rich doesn't mean that you're favored by God more than your brother. What James is saying is that each need to take heart for the poor. You need to take encouragement that they won't be like this forever. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not as good as it gets. This is never designed to be as good as it'll ever get. So it isn't a sin to be poor, and it doesn't mean that God loves you less because you are. Because on the day in which you go to heaven, you'll be exalted to a position that Christ has prepared for you. Have faith. Don't doubt that God in his glory, James says he'll exalt you. For the rich, what you need to know is that it isn't a sin to have money. But listen to, the, but listen to me. Don't focus on what the prosperity preachers will tell you, which is that money is important to the king of kings. That's not true. Rather, before you die, everything you have will fade. Everything that you're remembered for will ultimately pass away because this is not our home. You can't take anything with you when you die. Both rich and poor... They'll enter into judgment in the same manner, in the same situation with regards to earthly value. And you know the only value that you'll have in the time of judgment is what you've put into heaven. So folks, if you treasure anything, let it be the treasures in which you stored in heaven where moths can't destroy and thieves can't steal. So just like the flower that passes away, just like the sun that wither, withers the grass, all of our beauty will fade. The money the Lord will have given us will be spent. And everything you thought that mattered greatly on earth can fade into nothing. Why? Because it's a pale comparison to the exaltation of what heaven's glory is. Amen. So for this reason, let the rich rejoice. Not in the gifts that they have now, but rather in the gifts that God has given them for the future. To rejoice in grace and forgiveness. For it's in God's grace that keeps us humble. And in those trials and in those lessons, they teach us to seek our joy in God, not from riches, which are simply a reminder that this is just temporary. Praise God for the things he's given you. But remember, they don't make you complete. Only Jesus makes you complete. And so the evil one would love nothing more than for you to worship the temporary things of life that don't last. So James puts it in perspective in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to all those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Folks, God doesn't want us to give in to temptation. He doesn't want that. But he won't spare you from it. Like a parent, I don't want my kids to fail anything. But I will tell you that one of the things that I've learned in being a parent is that if my children do fail and they do learn a lesson, praise God for the lesson. So God doesn't want you to fail through temptation, but he won't keep you from it. Our life in, with Christ, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Which is interesting, because in the grand scheme of things, James will ultimately call our life a vapor. It's here one minute and then it's gone. So for those being tempted this morning... Please understand something. It is something for you to endure. It's something for you to put up with. But it's an active thing you endure. You don't just sit there like a doormat and let Satan just wipe his dirty feet all over you. But rather, 
here's the interesting aspect. It's designed for you to have endurance in mind in which you run after Christ. You flee from temptation and you deal with everything with God's grace. You cling to the Lord. You cling to the grace he offers. So James says that a mature person, he's patient in his trials. That God will orchestrate trials to help your faith grow. But that some in the church have misunderstood the difference between trials from the Lord and the evil one's temptations. See, with God, there's order. Satan cannot send a trial your way. He doesn't want your faith to grow. That's what trials do. They make you grow. Your faith gets stronger. It's the muscle, and you work it out. So trials and temptations, James says, God would never tempt you. You might be asking, well, why did James connect the two of trials and temptation? Because since the beginning of creation, starting with Adam, we've misunderstood the roles that trials and temptations have played in our lives. Here's a, a link for you to understand. Here's trials and temptations. When our circumstances are difficult, and we're in the middle of a trial, we may find ourselves starting to complain against God. God, why'd you do this? God, why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? Have I not been good? Have I not this? Has my family not that? Some might question his love. They might even resist his will. But at this point, here's where Satan involves himself. He'll bring out a temptation, an opportunity to escape. And he'll certainly tell you that God, if he really cared about you, would create a different avenue. But God doesn't want us to give in to temptation. But he won't spare us. Why? Because remember, as James says, we're not God's sheltered people. We're God's scattered people. We're everywhere. And if we're going to grow in our faith and become mature Christians, we must faith both we may face both temptings and trials. And so James put it in perspective. Do not blame God for the temptations of your life. He's too holy to be tempted, and he's too loving to tempt anybody else. God doesn't want you to fail. So his trials are designed for you to lean on him completely in order for you to be successful in the trial. This is what testing means. It reveals what areas you need to grow in. Adam in the garden, he was both tested. He was both tempted. The test was to listen to God, be obedient, don't eat the fruit. Now that sounds real simple. That sounds real basic. It's a pretty simple test, wouldn't you agree? But it's hard to master without depending on the Lord. The temptation was when Eve was presented with an option to be like God. She looked at the fruit, and when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise. She took the fruit, and she ate. And once she ate, she presented Adam with the fruit from Eve to be like God. So what was the response? After Adam sinned, it was the woman you gave me, God. One of my most favorite passages in all of Scripture. Right, fellas? <laughs> ah, but listen in. Almost saying, God, if you hadn't a created her, I wouldn't have done wrong at all. Just because someone blames God for their decisions doesn't mean that God is willing to take all of that blame. In fact... I know it's bad when we sin, but James says don't make it worse by blaming God. And since we know that God will test us through trials, you need to understand that God doesn't tempt you to fail. Your trial is designed for you to grow. And if you find yourself falling into sin, that's not a trial. You're just yielding to temptation. Listen, temptation is an opportunity. For you to accomplish a good thing in a bad way out of the will of God. Is it bad to be like God now? No. Here's what in fact it says. Trials are designed for you to be like Christ. And so I mentioned tests. Is it wrong to pass a test? No. Is it wrong to cheat to pass a test? 
Yes. It's not wrong to eat. But if you steal food, that's wrong. We think of sin as a single act. But God sees it as a process. That's why James spells it out for us. For instance, Adam committed one act of sin. Yet that one act, it brought sin. It brought death. It brought judgment on the whole human race. And the reason that James links trials and temptations in this area is that often we will turn a simple trial into a temptation in order to get out of it. And so James says, let's put that temptation in perspective. When being tempted, it starts with our desire. God, I just want to be rescued out of my circumstances. God, I just want this whole pain thing to stop. God, I want this. I want that. Your Bible, as you read it, might have the word lust. The word lust is any kind of desire. And it's not necessarily just a sexual one. The normal desires of life are given to us by God. And they themselves are not sinful. Truth be told, without desire, we can't function. Unless you feel hunger and thirst, you won't eat, you'll die. Without being tired, your body wouldn't rest, you'll die. Do you see the common factor in this? Sex is a normal desire. Without making babies, we die. It all goes into that concept. Having a desire isn't wrong. Desires are things given by God, but unfortunately, we're the ones who have corrupted them. And when it comes to temptation, first, it will begin by drawing you away. Then it entices. It's our desires that the evil one will use to entice us. I would never fall for a temptation if it didn't look good. I would never break a diet unless it really looked good. Do you like how I put really like that's going to make anybody feel better? I need you to know something. Desires become wrong when we want to satisfy these desires outside of God's will. Eating is normal, but gluttony is a sin. Sleep is normal, but laziness is a sin. Sex within marriage is wonderful, it's honorable, it's fantastic. But Hebrews says fornicators and adulterers, God's going to judge. So you say you want to be holy. I don't want to be tempted anymore. I don't want to fail anymore. Well, holiness is where we reject evil and we cling to what is good. So some people try to be so spiritual, they try to discipline their body to extremes. Every time that they're hungry, they refuse to eat to the point of death. Martin Luther used to beat himself senselessly for every sin that he committed in hopes that he would never commit that sin again. But listen... To discipline our body through all these extreme measures, it just makes us less human. It makes us look at God and go, we hate the creation you created. This is your fault. Don't fall for that. Don't listen to that. That's why God gave us grace. Through these measures, the desires of life, they're fuel to the tank. They make the engine go. If you turn off the fuel in the engine, you have no power. You're not going anywhere. But if you let the fuel have its way around the engine, you blow up. There's balance. See, the secret in understanding your desire is to have constant control with the Lord in which you depend on Him for every aspect of your life. These desires, they must be our servants, not our masters. And this we can only do through Jesus Christ. So either you rule your desires or your desires will rule you. James went on to say that if we're tempted in this process, we can be deceived. No temptation appears as a temptation, and it always seems more attractive than it really is. If you could see it coming from a mile away, you wouldn't yield to half the temptations that were presented to you. So James says that when a desire is in our life, that the evil one was going to entice us through deception and that a desire is going to draw us away, not away from ourselves, but draw us away from God and his will in our life. To draw it away is the idea of a trap. It's bait. In living out in Lloyd, I've learned more about fishing and hunting is that no fish seems to or no animal goes to the trap without something drawing them. I've never cast an empty hook and caught me a fish. You might have. I haven't. But that's the way the devil works in your life. 
And so you might sit there and go, yeah, but I've, I've never drank or I've never smoked. That's never even been an issue in my life. Well, why do you think you haven't been tempted in that? Because you won't fall for it. I'm not going to bait a certain bait and expect a unique animal. I'm going to tailor the bait for the animal that I'm trying to get. And the devil studies you. He knows where your eyes go. He knows where you lean. He knows what might be a desire. It's true, drugs may never have had an influence on you, but perhaps sex has. It's true, power may never mean much to you, but money does. You see, Satan is going to tailor it, and he'll deceive you through this process. Satan uses that bait to catch you, and you need to know that the bait is exciting. The bait not only attracts us, it hides the fact that when we yield to it, when we take the bait, that the desire will ultimately bring sorrow and punishment. See, in God's Word, we're given story after story about people who love the Lord, but yet, yet they yielded to temptations like crazy. In fact, we're studying at the beginning of King David's life. I believe that if David had known that when he looked at his neighbor's wife, that ultimately, after his adulterous affair with her, that it would cost him a child. That he would have committed murder against her husband. And that ultimately, Tamar would have been abused and raped. You need to know that if you knew the future, you probably wouldn't do those things either. But that's why we need to be reminded, before you take the bait of anything, weigh the cost. Is it worth it to you? No sin in my life has ever been worth the drama, the heartache, and the brokenness that it has caused in my life. Not once have I looked back and gone, I am so glad I sinned. I feel so much better having done that. No. Do you know what the Christian says? I'm sorry for my sin, and I feel so much better because of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in my life. You see, one of Satan's tools is he baits us without showing us the consequences of sin. So instead of taking the bait, we need to be more like Christ. When tempted by Satan, Jesus reminded Satan of God's holy and powerful word. It's the word of God that can stand up to temptations. Even when you're weak, he is ultimately strong. So know your word. When you know the Bible, you begin to see the bait. You begin to deal with it with an emphatic no. And this is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. James says that when we're being tempted, it can lead to disobedience. James says that our desires deceive us and our emotions and our thoughts can betray us. And so when it does, our actions lead us to be disobedient. Actions in our life are linked biblically to what is called the will. W-I-L-L. -L, the will. You see, church, God has a will for your life. God has a will for your life. But you know what? We have a will for ours, too. We have a will for our life. And Jesus, when he was just teaching the disciples to pray, I don't know if you've ever noticed or not, but he doesn't teach them to pray that their will be done, but rather their father's will to be done. James puts it in perspective that when being tempted, our desires will help us conceive a method to take the bait. Have you been there? Have you been looking around going, you know what? I'd like to be tempted today. No. Nobody wakes up, I believe, and thinks, you know, I'd really like to endure some temptation. No, what they do, though, is they go looking in areas they know they shouldn't be. They show up in places they knew they shouldn't have shown up at. They manufactured a system in which they would, be cho they would have to have a choice whether they would run to God or run to themselves. Ultimately, what happens when we're deceived is that our will becomes more important than God's. 
James says that your will will approve of your desire and that you have deceived yourself into putting yourself in the path of temptation and that since you approved of the bait, your will's desire is to sin. And that often you might hear people say, but it felt like the right thing to do. Living as a Christian, do you know what I've learned? It's a matter of the will, not of feelings. I hear believers say, I don't feel like going to worship at a building. Or I don't feel like attending a midweek Bible study or a ladies or men's studies. One commentator wrote, and I loved it. It said, children operate on the basis of feelings. But adults operate on the basis of will. Adults act because it's right no matter how they feel. You know how I learned that? When I was a child, I would wake up in the morning and I didn't feel like going to work. You don't feel like it. But when you're an adult and you have responsibilities, you have bills, people to take care of, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's time to go to work. Boy, if we only took that approach to worship. It explains why so many immature Christians easily fall into temptation, James says, because they let their feelings make decisions for their life in Christ. Oh, listen to me. If you're like me, you're growing real tired of allowing your desires to take you down a road that you know you should not be on. So we have to exercise saying no to temptation. It's a challenge. And you know where I find it easiest to say no? When I'm surrounded by other believers who are like-minded just like me. Boy, it's hard to yield to temptation standing before you right now. But it sure is easy to yield to temptation when we're all by our lonesome somewhere we shouldn't be. If you're like me, you're growing tired of it. It's time to exercise. And the more you exercise your will into saying no to temptation and yes to God's will, the more his will takes control of your life. If you don't, James says, look ahead. Let's see where sin ends up. Death. Disobedience gives birth to death, not life. For some, their sin is so egregious, they die immediately. For some, it takes years for the sin to mature. But when it does, the result is the same. It's death. If we'll only believe and we'll trust God and see the end result of this, it'll encourage us not to yield to temptation. For instance, the serpent used desire to interest Eve. For God knows that in that day you'll eat of it and your eyes will be open. I want my eyes open. You'll be like God, he says. I want to be like God, knowing good and evil. I'd like to know the difference. That sounds good to me. Is there anything wrong with gaining knowledge? No. Is there anything wrong with eating food? I hope not. I rather enjoy it. But Eve saw the tree that was good for food. Her desire was aroused, and she convinced herself it was the right thing to do, and then she convinced Adam. Paul described the deception of Eve leading to death in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, or 11, 3. It says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What he means is that people will make Christ more complicated than he needs to be. And ultimately you'll deceive yourself. That Satan will try everything to get you out of the mindset of Jesus. He's the deceiver. And he seeks to deceive your mind. And the bait he used was rather simple. It was something from a forbidden, it was a forbidden fruit from a forbidden tree. It was pleasant. She saw the bait. She forgot the Lord's warning. And of all the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you'll surely die. That was the warning. Eve disobeyed God, took the fruit, ate it. She shared it with Adam. But because Adam was not deceived, because he sinned with his eyes wide open, it was his sin that plunged the human race into where we are at today. Both Adam and Eve, they both experienced spiritual death right then, right there. 
Years later, they died. And so understand what James says, what all this leads to. Temptation is nothing to play with. It's nothing to flirt with. Don't go into temptation thinking I'm big, I'm bad, and I can handle it. Be smart and leave it. Be smart and move away from it. Everyone is tempted. No one's immune. It's not like Satan's ever going to take pity on you. Whether you're faced with temptation or not, this moment, this day, here's what you need to understand. You need to get your eyes off the bait and look ahead at the consequences of sin to see the judgment of God. If I do this, whatever it is, what's it going to cost me? And so finally, I'm going to wrap it up with verse 16. So today, James says in verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised. So because God doesn't want you to sin, because he's not going to tempt you, he wants you to know how good he is. And in verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Finally, only God can give a good gift. If you do something and it leads to sin, that's not good. Don't fool yourself. One of the enemy's tricks is to try to convince you that the Father might be holding out on you. That you might tell yourself that he, want, he doesn't love us. Look at where I'm at. Look at what I'm doing. Look at what I deserve. I want a little bit of mine. When Satan approached Eve, he suggested that if God really loved her, this is what he would say. God will permit you to do anything you want. That's simply not true. When Satan tempted Jesus, he really raised the question of hunger. If your father loves you, then why are you hungry? But when faced with all of those accusations, the goodness of God might actually come into question the goodness of God. Don't be deceived like Eve was. Satan is not capable of doing anything good. This world will tell you that good is in everybody. That's simply not true. There are people who are born just plain evil. And we, all of us, when we're born, are born without Jesus. We must be introduced to him. We must accept him. We must live for him. Nothing Satan does is good. And good will never be added to your life if you listen to him. Only God is good. And since God is good, we don't need any other person. And that includes Satan or whatever he might offer. I tell you today, it's better to be hungry in the will of God than it is to be absolutely full in sin. See, once we start to doubt God's goodness, that's when we start being attracted to what Satan has to offer. The same thing happens in marriages. When somebody starts flirting with evil, they start to lose sight on how good they actually got it at home. Well, James says that if you'll begin to put God's goodness into perspective of your life, if you'll trust his goodness, the goodness of God will help you from yielding to temptations. So very quickly, let me tell you what four things he says in order to focus in on God's goodness. First, only God gives good gifts, nobody else. If something good happens to you, if healing occurs to you, it was God. Please don't give credit to other people. Don't rob God of the glory of having done something great in your life. If somebody buys you a meal, thank them. But thank God, too. He did it. Amen. Everything good in this world comes from God. If it didn't come from God, it's not good. If it did come from God in this good area of life, right? James says, even if we don't see goodness happening around us, that means that, what? God is still doing good. We just need to open our eyes. Paul said about his thorn in the flesh, which was given to him by God. I think that's a pretty strange gift, don't you? I don't know about you, but I've, I've never asked God for thorns in my flesh. But in verse 12, 
This is what he said in verse 9. He said to me, after having asked Jesus to remove it, Jesus' reply is, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul said, therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in my reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. You want to be strong? Then be weak. And some of you watching right now, some of you listening right now, you think, man, I must be at my all-time strongest because I have never been more weak. Well, then you're in good company. Listen, the goodness of God is this. The manner in which God gives is good. What does that mean? When God gives a good gift, he gives it out of love. He gives it with his blessing. He's not going to make you feel guilty over the gift that he gives you. He's not the author of guilt. He's the author of love. And ladies and gentlemen, he wouldn't give you a good gift if he didn't want to. Don't ever look at something that God gives and think, Oh, shucks, I don't deserve this. I don't need this, God. Please take it back. That makes no sense biblically. As a parent, if I give a gift to my family, not once do I want them to give it back going, no thanks, I don't deserve this. That would do nothing but hurt my feelings. But in the manner in which he gives it is so good, sometimes you need to think about it in that context is that he wanted to. Nobody at Christmas time likes to receive a gift from somebody because they had to. Hey, thanks for my uh, item that you got me. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, I had to. It's Christmas and all that. That'll take the joy right out of the gift giving. And that definitely takes the joy out of receiving it. And how many times do we rob God of the joy of giving? How many times do we rob the joy of somebody giving us something and we suck it right out of them? Why? It's a choice to rejoice. And when you look at somebody and go, I'm not worthy, or I don't want it, or I don't deserve it, or I this, or I that, all you do is just suck the life-giving nature that God wants to offer. When God gives us a blessing, he does it in a loving manner. He's gracious. Now, what he gives, I don't know. How he gives and the timing he gives, it always seems to be when I least expect it, and I'm not sure why. But I know this. He did it because he wanted to. And you know what else James says? He gives constantly. James says that the gifts we receive, it comes from the Father of lights. You know, God's not in a roundabout way. He's not cloak and dagger in his gifts. He didn't funnel it through some organization just because that's how he does. It came from him direct. And it didn't say this. Understand what James goes through. It didn't say past tense. He gives constantly. And it says because he gives it constantly, it's not based on your merit. You did good, so you get good. You did the right thing, so you got right things happening to you. That's not the manner in which God is good. He's not good because you are good or he has an abundance. Oh, I've got a quota. I better give out a little bit more good to people. I've got it storing up too much in heaven, so we'll let some go. That's not God. He doesn't think in terms like we think. We don't think in terms like he thinks. So he gives constantly because that's who he is. And so ask God. God, I need some good today. It's been a pretty tough one. I need some good this week. It's been a pretty tough one. I need some good because the last couple of years has been pretty raw. So God give. You know why James says he can do all of that? Because he doesn't change. We change. God doesn't change. Which is interesting because so many people seem to be so surprised by God. You won't believe what God did. Why? We have his holy word. It's been saying that for the last 6,000 plus years about how good he is. Why are we the ones surprised by it? God doesn't change. There's no shadows with the father of lights, James says. It's impossible 
for God to change. You know why? Because he can't change for the worse. Why? He's holy. And because God is perfect, he's not going to change for the better. The light that the sun has, which I think is interesting. Last week, it was so bright, the temptation was, do I wear some sunglasses? Today, it's shadowed and overcast. It might even rain on us. But do you know one thing I know? It's not the sun that stops shining, but the clouds hit it pretty good. Which means this in our life. One week, you may have a full sh sun shining moment. But if you let the clouds of temptation enter into your life and how, allow your desires, allow you to be enticed, and you become disobedient, do you know what that does? The sun is still shining, but you hit it really, really well. This is not a question about salvation. This is a question of whether you want God's will to be the only thing that matters to you in your life. Stop running. Unless it's away from evil. Stop hiding unless it's hiding God's word in your heart to come out of it. God never originated your sin. He's not the author of it. So when you're going through some trials, understand that God put those there so that your faith can grow in him. But when you've put yourself into a temptation, God is not the one tempting you. But God is so loving, he'll create a way for you to escape it. But you have to want it. In fact, that's really the whole idea of this sermon today. Is how much do you really want God's will for you and in your life today? This is the perspective that our whole mindset should have. Is that I want God and God alone. That's all I want. And so as we close, as we sing a final song. Have courage. Stand up. And say, God, I only want your will. I only want your way. I'm tired of doing things my way. I'm sorry for all the times that I have yielded to temptation. I'm sorry for the sin of my life. I know how good you are. Because I can just look back in my life and see your hand in all these things I've done. Help me. Help me. Let's close. Father, we love you. And if there's any here, any watching today that are living apart from you and they want you, hear their prayer that we are a sinner who needs your grace. And so in this moment, God, help us to stand up and want your will in our lives to be done. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the trials in our lives that bring us close to you. But thank you that every time we've been tempted, you've provided a way of escape. We praise your holy name. In Jesus we pray. Amen.
Well, thank you guys for tuning in and thank you for coming. It's good to see you. So folks, just so you know, there's no Wednesday service, as John said, for the rest of the month. Next Sunday, the doors are open for the sanctuary. You're free to come in. You're free to stay in your cars. You're free to watch online, whatever you choose. Because one thing I love about where we live is we offer a buffet of choices, don't we? Amen. And so, folks, stay tuned for all kinds of things in the coming months to come. May God bless you this day. And if it starts to rain in a little bit, feel free to take a nap. Because why? Naps are good. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. And as we depart from this place, we choose to rejoice in you. Lord, thank you for your love and all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Goodbye, everybody.